Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. In December of 2003, a 200-voice choir at Pacifica High School in Oxnard, California, was to sing Lee Greenwood's patriotic anthem, God Bless America, at the close of a school program. Afraid using the name God might offend some of the parents, the directors changed the words from God bless the USA to I love the USA. Well, parents were indeed upset, but not in the way the school officials had anticipated. Parents were upset that God had been removed from the program, and God had been removed from the song. And some of the parents removed their kids from the program. Some of them wrote angry emails to the school board members and school district leaders. And fearing a lawsuit, the school reversed its decision, put God back in the song and back in the program. School board president Ron Speakman said, and I quote, it was a misguided attempt to be politically correct, and it has been rectified. In April of 2012, a Massachusetts elementary school made plans to change the words of God bless the USA to we love the USA for a school presentation. On his website, Lee Greenwood wrote, and I quote, I would hope that we haven't lost the ability to speak aloud about the God we pray to for our continued existence as a free nation. Father David Mullen of nearby St. Brendan Parish called the school's plan to change the song's ly lyrics as ridiculous and said people today are in denial about the Christian roots of America. He said, and I quote, all these people are attacking the very root of where our revolution began and the religious principles for which our nation has stood for. And because of the public pressure, Edward Fleury, the superintendent of schools, reversed the school's initial decision, and God was once again reinstated into the song and their program. God has promised on more than one occasion throughout Scripture that he would bless that nation who would follow him and choose to, to obey him, and that he would punish that nation that refused to do so. For 238 years of our existence as a country, a free country, the United States of America has been blessed by God. He has kept that promise because of the faith of, of those who have gone before us, who built this nation upon Christian principles. But there are signs today that we may be losing God's blessings. And we need to understand the problems that we face in America are not to be blamed on God. Jesus once said, without me you can do nothing. And the reason that's true is because the Apostle Paul said that with Christ or in Christ, all things hold together. The problem we face in America today is a direct result of our choosing our choice to remove God from our individual lives, from our families, from our, our schools, our government, our courtrooms, and so on. This is a crucial time in our lives. And I know you've heard that before, but I mean that. It is a crucial time. Are we going to remain true to our spiritual roots as individuals and as a nation in spite of the daily assaults that Satan places upon us? Or... Will we silently submit to the pressures of ungodly forces wanting to remove God from this society, period? It's a choice we have, or question we have to ask, choice we have to make. So if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 24, once again we're looking at a, a, a New Testament Scripture that ties into our Old Testament reading. And Jesus says there, beginning with verse, 20, or verse 1, chapter 24, as Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But Jesus responded, Do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and they said, Tell us, when will this happen? What sign will signal your return in the end of the world? And Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. 
They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested and persecuted and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, that is the one who will be saved. If you take out the outlines there on the inside of your bulletins, we, we see in our text, and we're also going to allude to Amos chapter 8 in the Old Testament, if you want to turn to that as well, the evidence of the warning signs that I had talked about earlier. Jesus had alluded in Matthew chapter 23 to the future destruction uh, of the Jerusalem and of the many temple buildings. And the disciples were puzzled by what Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 23. And they couldn't believe that Jesus was saying that all of these beautiful buildings in, in Jerusalem would, would eventually be destroyed. So they came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 with two questions. When will this destruction that you are referring to happen? And the second question was, what will be the sign of your coming back and the end of the age? Now, when the disciples asked these two questions, they thought that they tied in together. They linked the end of the age, the end of the time, the end of the world. They linked that with the destruction that Jesus was talking about here in Jerusalem. They thought they, were, they went together. But in actuality, they're two separate questions, two separate events. And that's why sometimes when we read what Jesus has to say here in Matthew chapter 24 and in the other gospel accounts, we're kind of confused because we try and put all of the information together at one time. Now, we know from history that in the year 70 A.D., just a few years after Jesus said this, after a 143-day siege, a Roman military force consisting of about 30,000 troops came and broke down the walls of Jerusalem, entered into the city, burned the city, destroyed the city completely, including the temple, and brutally slaughtered what is estimated to be between 600,000 and a million Jews in the year 70 A.D. And while Matthew doesn't record Jesus' answer to the first question the disciples asked. Luke does in chapter 21, verses 20 through 24 of Luke. Matthew records Jesus' answer to the second question. What will be the sign of your coming back, and when will be the end of the age, the end of time? Now, my point here in the message today is not to present a case that the end is near, that Christ's coming is imminent. It could be. And, and biblically speaking, we are living in the end times. But then we have been for 2,000 years. And so Christ could return at any moment. My, my context this morning is to use the predictions that Jesus shared here in Matthew 24, as well as the predictions that Amos talks about, which is we'll go back to our Old Testament readings from this last week and see some of the warning signs that, that America right now is not in sync with God. And, and we need to quickly turn back to God because if we don't, we will be very much deserving of God's punishment. The dictionary tells us the purpose of signs are to communicate and convey information such that those who receive that information can make an intelligent decision based upon the information they've received. For instance, a wise driver is one who, going down the road, sees the various signs and makes adjustments to his or her driving dependent upon the information that they receive from that sign. Throughout history, God has often provided various signs to communicate what he was doing or what he, he would do. And 
He gave that information to his people, and it was their responsibility to take that information and then make intelligent decisions based upon the information they received. Now, if we look at the life of Christ, we see that many saw the signs and many saw the miracles that Jesus performed, and, and they put their faith in him. And let me just cite some examples. First of all, in John chapter 2, when Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, the Bible tells us in in John chapter 2 and verse 11, this was Jesus' first display of His glory. And as a result, His disciples believed in Him. And they saw that and they said, this has to be the Messiah. Later in that same book, or in the same, same chapter, uh, verse 20, we are told because of the miraculous signs that Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many people were convinced that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. In chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, one of the Pharisees named Nicodemus came to Jesus when it was dark. Nobody could see him. And, and he said, Teacher, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. And here's how we know. Your miraculous signs are proof enough that God is with you. And then later in John chapter 11, the leading priests and the Pharisees called an emergency meeting together of the high council. What are we going to do, they asked. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. Why, if we leave him alone, if we don't do something, the whole nation's going to follow him. So what do we do? <clears throat> now, on the other hand, Jesus' miraculous signs didn't impress everybody. John records for us, despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people didn't believe in him. Jesus condemned the cities of, of Bethsaida and Chorazin, and he said, if I had done the miracles in Tyre and Sidon that I did in, in, in those two cities, why, the people of Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. In fact, he also condemned the city of Capernaum, and he said to the people of Capernaum, if I had done the miracles in Sodom centuries ago, if the miracles that I've done in, in Capernaum had been done in Sodom, well, those, those people would have repented of their sins as well. And there was an occasion when the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they came to Jesus, and they asked Jesus to show them some kind of a miraculous sign in the heaven. Well, if you really are the Messiah, show us, demonstrate it to us. And Jesus said, you know, you guys, you, you were good at looking at the skies and telling the weather from the conditions that you see there in, in, the, in the skies. But you can't see the obvious signs of the time spiritually and culturally. Only an evil and, and faithless generation would ask for a miraculous sign. And then Jesus walked away from them. He didn't give them the miraculous sign that they wanted, that they'd asked for. Because Jesus knew these guys weren't sincere. They didn't really want to see the power of God. Their minds were already made up. They didn't believe in Jesus. And Jesus knew there wasn't a thing that He could do that would make them change their minds. And what was true then is, is even true today. I mean, how many people over the centuries have sworn their loyalty to God? Oh man, if you just get me out of this predicament, Lord. Maybe some of us have done that. Just get me out of this predicament. Man, I'll swear my allegiance to you, man. I'm all yours. I'm all in on this if you just help me with this situation. Only after God has fulfilled His end of the bargain do we, do we turn around and we, we forget Him. I mean, we have miracles recorded in the Old Testament and miracles recorded in the New Testament. And for 2,000 years, we have heard the stories and the, the testimonies of people who have seen the power of God. And, and even today, amongst us, we have lots of stories of how God has demonstrated His power, and yet people still don't believe. And with all of the evidence that is out there, if people still don't believe, what's one more sign going to do? One more sign isn't going to change people's minds. If their minds are already made up, they're not going to believe. And so what I'm saying is that God has promised to bless any nation that follows Him. And God has promised to punish 
any nation that ignores Him or disobeys Him. But if you've noticed, if you've been reading with us in the Old Testament, in His unfathomable grace, God doesn't just lower the boom. Man, that's it. I've had it with you. God gives us all kinds of time to turn it around individually and corporately. His grace is unbelievable. He gives us lots of signs that we need to repent. We need to turn. I mean, we can't read the Old Testament without marveling at how much grace God really has. No nation was ever blessed like the nation of Israel. And yet, Israel continually turned their back on God and they reached the time when, when God had to punish them. And what was true then is still true today of Israel, of America, of any nation. And now that we understand the purpose of signs, I think it would behoove us to look at what I think are four warning signs that we need to look at, we need to heed here in America as evidence that we need to repent. I mean ASAP. So let's look at four signs that we cannot ignore. The first comes from Matthew 24, verses 5 through 8, where Jesus talks about the increase of wars. The 30-year war was fought in Europe, in the area that we now know of as Germany, from 1618 to 1648. Now, it started out as a, a dispute between Protestants and Catholics, but it eventually spread way beyond that and lasted 30 years. Years. It was one of the longest continuous wars in modern history. It was one of the most destructive wars in European history as, as entire regions of Europe were totally decimated. As a matter of fact, approximately 7 million people died during the 30-year war from 1618 to approximately 20 million people lost their lives in the four-year war that we know of as World War I. And approximately 62 million people lost their lives in the six-year war that we know of as World War II. According to a study released by History Today in the year 2011, the number of wars has steadily increased from 1870 to 2011. And at the present, America has military forces or peacekeeping forces in Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Colombia, Libya, Liberia, Kosovo, Haiti, Sudan, Mali, Somalia, Pakistan, the Philippines, Yemen, South Korea, just to name a few. Now, I understand that mankind has always fought. Ever since the time when um, Cain killed his brother Abel back in Genesis chapter 4. But today it seems like the anger of the world, I mean, it seems like it to me. The anger of the world is focused on America and Israel. Now, I don't know if you saw this in our readings, but Sometimes God, God allows pagan nations to fight against those whom He has blessed. And sometimes God even fights on their side. For example, in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, we read, Although the Arameans attacked Judah and Jerusalem with only a small army, the Lord helped them, this pagan army, the Lord helped them conquer the much larger army of Judah. His people. And why did God do that? Because the Bible tells us the people of Judah had abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors. So judgment was executed against them. Now if God would do that back then, don't you think God might do that today? Is it not possible that sometimes God might even aid our enemies? as a means of bringing down judgment upon us when we turn our backs on Him? So one sign that we need to heed is the sign of increased wars. A second one is also found in Matthew 24, verses 8-11. through And that is 
increased hostility towards Christians. Now Jesus warned that many false prophets would come out and they would lead people astray from the truth. And, and when people were led astray from the truth, sin would flourish everywhere. And I don't know if you've picked up on this, but we live in a society today that isn't content to be indifferent towards Christianity. No, we live in a society today that is increasingly indignant towards Christianity. A union official representing federal employees at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida is demanding that two senior management officials resign from their positions or be fired from their posts. And the reason the official is so upset is because these two senior management officials at Eglin Air Force Base, they did the unthinkable. They put decals on their trucks and in their office supporting Duck Dynasty star Phil Robertson. Well, can you believe that? Now, if you know, Phil Robertson is an unashamed Christian. Man, he speaks his mind. And he spoke about several issues in a recent issue of GQ magazine. And had Alan Cooper taken the time to maybe talk to the membership within his union, he might have discovered that many agree with Phil Robertson, support him. But Cooper chose instead to speak on behalf of all of them. Brian Fisher from the American Family Association tells about a policeman in Utah recently who was fired from his, his position because he refused to lead a gay pride parade in Utah while he was on duty and consequently lost his job. Fisher concludes, and I quote, every advance of the homosexual agenda comes at the expense of religious liberty. And then he gives an example. Churches in Denmark have been ordered to perform sodomy-based weddings whether they want to or not. No options, no exceptions, no choice. Homosexuals are to be married wherever they want regardless of whose conscience is trampled. And then he asks the question, how long before American churches are ordered by our government to do the same if they want to keep their tax-exempt status. He asked if a baker can be ordered to bake a wedding cake for a homosexual wedding in spite of his conscience, why won't the government or courts soon tell preachers to do the same? Good question. When Muslim attacks are even mentioned, in the national news media, the victims are often described as non-Muslims. And in many case, cases, they're Christians. But our national news media doesn't want to bring that out. It's reported that in Egypt, in the last three years, 550 Christian women and girls have been abducted from their homes by Muslim men who then give them a Muslim name and force them to marry their captors. Did you ever hear that one in the news media? What kind of an outrage would the media have if Christians had abducted 300 Muslims in Nigeria for 300 Muslim girls and still not returned them to their families today? Why, there would be a huge outrage. And two months later, 60 more women and 31 schoolboys were abducted by these same terrorists whose stated purpose is to force Nigeria to become exclusively Muslim. Jesus said, you will be hated all over the world because of your allegiance to me. You will be arrested. You will be persecuted. You will even be killed because of your faith in me. And I'm just simply saying, the hatred towards Christians that is going on in Sudan and Iran and Nigeria and China and Uganda is beginning to find its way now into America. Now let's go back to Amos chapter 8 for another sign that we're in trouble. And it's, it's in verses 4 through 10, and I think it's a, the evidence of our increased selfishness. Listen to this. Amos said, you who rob the the poor and trample down the needy, you can't wait for the Sabbath day to be over and the religious festivals to end so that you can get back to cheating the helpless. You measure out grain with dishonest measures and you cheat the buyer with dishonest scales. How often do we see that in America today? You mix the grain you sell with chaff that is 
swept from the floor. Then you enslave poor people for one piece of silver or a pair of sandals. I will never forget the wicked things you have done. Even Christ's disciples wrestled with this issue of selfishness. James and John, sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said, hey, look, we got a favor. When you get into your kingdom and your place of honor, one of us would like to sit on your right side and the other on your left side. So even Jesus' disciples who, who observed Jesus day after day, they saw how Jesus had time for anyone. They saw how Jesus listened to, to anyone. He affirmed even the outcast of society. If even they had a problem with selfishness, then I guess we're going to have a problem with it too today. Know this, Paul wrote to his mentee Timothy, the last days will be very difficult times. And do you know why they will be so difficult? Because Paul wrote to Timothy, people will love only themselves and love only their money. Ouch. Despite all of its advancements, science has never put forth a vaccine to combat this deadly character flaw we call selfishness. Can't take a pill for that. The only remedy for selfishness is the one proposed by the great physician. Jesus said we must be willing to die to ourselves. Take up our cross and then follow Him. Imitate Him. Mother was preparing pancakes for her two sons, Kevin, who was five years of age, and Ryan, who was three years of age. Boys began to argue over who was going to get the first pancake. You ever had that kind of argument, that kind of disagreement in your family? Yeah, well, they had it. I get the first pancake. No, I get the first pancake. And so this went on between the boys, and the mother saw this as an opportunity for a spiritual lesson. Boys, if Jesus were here, Jesus would, Jesus would say, let my brother have the first pancake, I can wait. So the older brother, Kevin, turns to his younger brother and says, Ryan, why don't you be Jesus for the moment and give me the first pancake? <laughs> I mean, we all have a problem with this. We're born with that selfish nature. Jesus showed us and Jesus taught us the Son of Man. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve others. Jesus came to give His life as a ransom for you and I. Every word we say, every decision we make, every purchase we make, ought to be preceded with, by an honest question. Is this for my benefit or is this for the benefit of others? Is this to make me happy or is it to maybe bring some happiness into the lives of someone else? Am I being me-oriented right now or am I being other-oriented? I'm telling you that when we follow the example of Jesus, selflessness, that's when the world is good and right. But we're not seeing that in America. We're seeing an increase of selfishness. And then lastly, again in Amos verses 11 through 13, God says through the prophet Amos, the time is coming. When I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from border to border searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Beautiful girls and strong young men will grow faint in that day, thirsting for the Lord's word. And I got some good news this morning. Nearly nine out of ten households in America, 88%, have a Bible in their home. The fact of the matter is, on average, there are 3.5 Bibles. Some people obviously are sharing a Bible. 3.5 Bibles in every home, and 24% or a fourth of all homes have six or more Bibles in their home. That's the good news. The bad news is that on average, including Christians, only one-third of adults are picking up and reading their Bible. As a result, the Barna Research Group tells us that fewer than half of all adults in America can name the four Gospels. Less than half can tell you Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four Gospels. Sixty percent of Americans 
Can't name even five of the Ten Commandments. It's no wonder that we don't keep the Ten Commandments. We don't know what they are. 82% of all Americans, including Christians, believe the phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is a Bible verse. 12% of all adults believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. 50% of graduating seniors from high school thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were a husband and a wife. And a large number of graduating seniors thought that the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. Many Christians cannot identify more than two or three of Jesus' twelve disciples. This isn't society's fault. Christ's followers have to own up to the problem. Biblical knowledge begins in the home. Scripture is very clear. It's the parent's primary responsibility to be the primary educator of their children when it comes to knowing the Word of God. But even in the church, preachers and and children's workers and youth ministers and adult ministers, we all need to look and ask ourselves, are are we using the Word of God in our activities in our classes? Are we teaching the Word of God? Are we studying the Word of God? Are we trying to promote and help people to get into the Word of God? Because our values and our beliefs are going to be shaped by what we think. And what we think has to come from here and not from out there. God was well pleased with the temple that, and the buildings that Solomon and the people of Israel had built many centuries ago, but in spite of the fact that God was pleased with what they had done, God still gave Solomon a warning because God knows people. And God said to Solomon at times, at times I might have to shut up the heavens so that no rain falls, or I might have to command locusts to devour your crops, or I might have to send plagues among you. And we know from reading Scripture that Oftentimes they did. They turned their backs on God and so God had to come through with those punishments that He had promised. And we have no reason to believe that God wouldn't do the same if we continue to turn our back on God today. And all the signs indicate that as a nation, that's exactly what we're doing. We need a change. And it starts with you and me changing individually, taking personal responsibility for for my knowledge of what God's Word says. And we need to change corporately as well. And we're going to take some time to pray that prayer that God told Solomon about. But before we do, let's, let's watch this video. So God told Solomon, now there may be times when I have to do these things. And then he gave him this promise. But if my people who are called by my name, who is that? It's not the world. It's us. If we will humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from our our wicked ways, God said, I will hear from heaven your prayers, our prayers, and I will heal your land. We're going to silently pray that prayer and ask God to bless us as an individual, as a family, as a church, as a nation. And if you feel comfortable and if you've got enough room there, I'm going to ask you to, to fall to your knees with me. But all of us, let's, let's silently take some time to pray right now. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you to in, invite you to join with me in the Lord's Prayer as we close out this time of prayer.
forgive us of our sins, not just the sins of the nation, but forgive us of our individual sins, whether it's our apathy, whether it's a failure to to read your word and know your word as, as we should, or to implement it and obey it. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Hear our prayers. And thank you for those individuals in the 238 years plus of this nation's history that that sacrificed their lives not just for the good of the nation but because they loved you they wanted this country to be a light into the world so we lift up these prayers we join them with the prayers of many others who who are praying for our country this day and this week as we celebrate our independence. And and Lord, we, we lift all of these up in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 